Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. Born in Gladwin, Pennsylvania on June 25, 1886, Henry Harley Arnold, later nicknamed Hap, graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1907. Initially commissioned as a second lieutenant in the infantry, a role he disliked, Arnold later jumped at the opportunity to train at the Wright Brothers Aviation School in Dayton, Ohio. It was there in 1911 he became one of the first three qualified pilots in the U.S. military. During the decades that followed, Arnold advanced in rank and responsibilities, becoming the commanding general of Army Air Forces in 1942. During World War II, Arnold was responsible for overseeing a massive expansion of U.S. Air Forces and for directing air combat activity against Germany and Japan. Arnold's contributions during that time would eventually earn him the five-star general rank in both the U.S. Army and the newly created U.S. Air Force, which came into being in 1947. To date, Arnold is the only person to hold a five-star rank in two U.S. military branches. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, we'll be speaking with General Hap Arnold's grandson, Robert Arnold. Robert will share stories about his grandfather's life, including his love of practical jokes and his friendship with fellow aviation pioneers Billy Mitchell and Jimmy Doolittle. Robert will also discuss his grandfather's passion for expanding his country's air power capabilities and how he played a significant role in the development of the U.S. Air Force. I'd now like to welcome Robert Arnold to our show. Welcome, Robert. Hey, glad to be here. I've been looking forward to speaking with you because, as many of my listeners know, I'm a big fan of World War II history, and your grandfather, General Henry H. Hap Arnold, was an incredible player in the Second World War and and in other times of American history, aviation history. So terrific that we have you here, and I know that you are a good storyteller because I've listened to some of your stories already. Well, let's hope we can, we can do it again one more time. (laughs) Uh, Sure. So general Arnold, he had earned the ranks of general of the army and general of the air force. He was five-star general in both. So I think, is that the only time that ever happened in American history? That's correct. Uh, He's the only one who ever had that rank twice. Um, And also, he's the first, last, and only airman to ever have five-star rank. First, last, and only. I mean, that's an incredible thing in history to have that. And uh, what a a thing to be bestowed upon him. He must have had incredible credentials, and that's what we're going to talk about right now. Mm -hmm. But one of the other things really intrigued me about your grandfather's history is that he was one of the very earliest American military aviators. That's right. Yeah. So he he actually learns to fly at the Wright Brothers School in Dayton, Ohio, with Orville Wright and the whole crew out there in 1911. Uh, And he and his buddy Tommy Milling is there at the same time, are the first two trained by the Wright Brothers on the original contract. Now, there were some other Army guys who had kind of done some things sort of semi-independently. But they are the two. They are the original two. Uh, and he used to wear it. We wore through his entire life a badge that said military aviator on it, which was what the uh, the original group of them were called. Uh, and that became obsolete at a point with Air Force wings. But that was one of the few things he wore through his entire life. In fact, people ask me, where is that military aviator badge? And I said, he's still wearing it. It's an Arlington Cemetery <laughs> dress uniform. That's where it is. <laughs> yeah. Now, Robert, I assume that you yeah. fly occasionally, you know, travel by flight occasionally? Of course, of course, yes. Okay. When you get on a uh, modern jet plane, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you ever just think, 
my grandfather was taught to fly by i think it was orville right that's the that yeah it, orville was there at the time wilbur was in uh was in france uh working the working through the patent issues and stuff in france wow what does that feel like though well, it, it's it's kind of interesting because um, you know you know so much about it. I mean, just the whole sweep of the thing. Uh, and then what I'm always amazed, I've been flying in airplanes as a passenger since I was a kid, and of course that's changed over time. But the whole the whole thing kind of gets to you about how complex a dance this is now. You know, when my grandfather got in, it was the letter rip moment. I mean, I the closest I've come to that is years ago. I, I uh, the folks who had the old Spunkmeyer company had a couple of DC threes one of which was Hap Arnold's uh, wartime plane that they had restored. And they very nicely took me up in a flight in it uh, over San Francisco Bay and the Golden Gate Bridge. And I'm sitting in the jump seat. Uh, and this is the same plane that he flew in the left seat in front of me. I mean, this is really cool. Anyway, with the 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 crew flying, it was, they had this old, this old duffer in the left seat, some old captain in the left seat. And the right seat is the young guy, just in case the other guy has a heart attack and dies, right? You know, so so anyway, so we're staying there and they're talking to the tower uh, over at Oakland. And all of a sudden the old guy says, OK, let's let her rip and starts pushing some buttons. <laughs> anyway, so going back to the old days where, where you didn't sit there and, you know, do all this high techie Star Wars stuff, you know, let her rip. You know, and I just I thought I heard the echo right there and. I, I really uh, try. I didn't laugh in front of him. I'm just very amused by the whole thing. And it was a, a great moment of lifting off in a slow paced wing over from an air from a big airstrip as opposed to that sort of like Disneyland uh, rocket takeoff, you know, that you get with modern ones. Here's this thing that just lumbers down the thing and just slowly lifts in the air and, and gracefully wings over. And you're still over the airport for a long time. And, and those are the kind of moments where you sit there and you kind of feel almost what they saw, you know, that, that you you saw something that uh, was graceful as a bird would have been, you know, that kind of a thing. And that's what I kind of see that that moment. But the modern stuff is just like the dance that goes on, the professionalism of everybody concerned, the way it works uh, just stuns me how far it's come. It really does. Yeah. And I think largely because of people like your grandfather sort of, you know, marking the way. Well, yeah, it, it's interesting with, with him. He, he starts out, uh, he's a, a kind of has an unusual, uh, unusual career. He's an, always an out of the box kind of guy. He gets into the flying thing uh, as a reaction in his career to where he wants to not be in the army infantry and somebody he knows in the signal corps says, Hey, would you like to, get into this flying business and, and he says yes because he's always willing for some adventure or something out of the box but the, the 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 moment that's really interesting for him is that he's coming back from the philippines from his first assignment he's been a, a infantry officer in the philippines after he leaves west point and he's not happy being an infantry officer and has tried everything possible to do jobs that wasn't that while he's there and it really works for him um and he's coming back through Europe because in those days you could catch a, uh, a boat going east or a boat going west. The army was going to pay for either way. And so he decided he'd go see this Europe place he's always heard about. So he ends up briefly in Paris and uh, for a night or two. And he's going to see this town that he's always heard about. He's walking down a street and he looks up at the corner and hanging over him is Blario's plane that just just flown over the english channel which was a worldwide event oh, and he looks cool. up at this spindly little crazy little thing with wires is hanging there and he has this thought and he, in his mind he says if one why not many mm -hmm. this is the military mind because he knows from history that napoleon couldn't cross the english channel right and all of that history and here he's looking at this crazy French guy had gotten into this silly little machine and it crossed over. And all I could think of for that instant is what if there were a lot of them? So as, as a, as a student of military history from West Point, he knows about the, 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 the Napoleon, the great Napoleon, the one that they all look up to as the military genius uh, couldn't cross the English channel and, uh, and defeat the British. And so he thinks, well, if one of these things can cross the English Channel, why not many? So I think he, he sees it at that instant. 
but he also looks at this crazy little thing with wires and this little tiny Blario plane hanging there like a like a like a butterfly in a collection over the street. He says, but not in that one. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> and, and he's right about that, because that's a pretty dangerous airplane to fly around in. But then he mar then he goes off and he returns to the United States and they're going to stick him back in, in infantry duties, which is going to bore him. And then the, his friend at the at the Signal Corps, who he has met at this um, uh, at this time in the Philippines, he made a friend. Um, says, "Hey, uh, would you be interested in volunteering for this incredibly dangerous thing called being a pilot? Because the army wants to pick up a couple of them." And of course, he'd be thinking outside the box. Says, "Sure, I'm in." Mm -hmm. And that's how that's how it all picks up. That is really cool. And I want to just back up a little bit. You mentioned West Point. Can you sure. bring us back to your grandfather's early years? Where was he born? And sure. what brought him to West Point? Yeah, it, it's a completely by accident. Uh, he is born uh, the son. Uh, he's the uh, one of uh, three sons of a country doctor uh, from the old main line in Philadelphia, outside Philadelphia. Uh, his father, uh, my great grandfather, uh, was a uh, doctor, but he was also part of the Pennsylvania militia and had gone to war in uh, Cuba. The old went with Teddy Roosevelt, as we like to say, not really, but in the same place. Um, and 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 a big uh, figure in the what we now call the National Guard. And so he had grown up seeing this. But what happens is, is my great grandfather, his uh, his father. Uh, had decided that, that he wanted one of his sons to go to West Point and get one of these coveted uh, you know, appointments, which are a big deal to get. So uh, he had managed to wangle one of these for uh, perhaps older brother Tom. Tom was uh, kind of a free spirit uh, with, throughout his entire life. And Tom says, I'm not going. <laughs> and so... <laughs> <laughs> Oops. So, yeah, I'm not going to go. So anyway, so... So my great grandfather um, uh, says not going to be humiliated in the face of his political friends who had gotten his appointment. So he spins around to to my grandfather to half and says, "You're going," and he says, "I am. Yes, you are. You're going to go." So they managed to make that work out. I guess it was a little easier doing those days. Anyway, so half is sent off to West Point completely by accident. Uh, because Tom was supposed to go, and I think they thought Hap was going to be in the old school. You know, one's going to be this, one's going to be that. I think they decide Hap is going to be a minister or something. You know, how they do the old family thing. And so, so he ends up there. Uh, and he and Hap had been a big uh, football player at the old you know, Lower Marion High School. In fact, the, the football field is still there, named after him. And and he'd been that kind of a sporty guy and a, and, a, and a, what we would now call a man's man kind of guy. So he likes the environment at West Point. He's not the world's greatest student, but he likes that whole thing. You know, it's just and he starts becoming a, um, a practical joker, which is he was his entire life. And he had a whole little renegade band of these guys that did all kinds of things. And they got in a lot of trouble. So they were always uh, having demerits. And in fact, he graduates wearing no cadet rank. He's what they call a clean sleever because <laughs> they will. He has so many demerits. <laughs> they won't let him do this. But he uh, but he makes all these friends and he has high scores for leadership stuff. And this is where he really excels, along with an interesting also uh, his best subjects are science and math. But as a result of all of this hijinks, he is denied his dream of being in the United States Cavalry, which at that time was the romantic uh, division of the U.S. Army. Uh, so they stuck him in the infantry, which was as, as then, and I'm sure it is now, considered the low end of the West Point, um, the West Point deal, engineers being always the top one. So, uh, so he, he is not happy about that, and that's how he ends up in the Philippines. So when you mentioned about his dad being a country doctor, what about his mm -hmm. mom? What was she like? My great grandmother. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah. She's uh, she's an interesting one. She was the counterbalance in that family. The doctor, by all standards, according to my father, uh, was just a very austere uh, and very stern figure. Somebody you stayed away from wasn't a lot of fun. Very, um, uh, uh, shall we say, teetotaler, anti-dancing, that whole kind of thing. Very hardcore Baptist. 
Louisa Harley, and that's where the Harley comes from. That's, that's her family's name. Uh, that family is out of Harleysville, Pennsylvania, and they're still there. They were what we would call more of the, uh, the brethren type Pennsylvania folks. They were a sect of that. And uh, uh, she was much more of the uh, caring, loving figure in that family, the counterbalance. And he just adored his mother. Uh, in fact, when she f- passes away suddenly uh, later in life, it's uh, one of the big tragedies of his life. It affects him deeply. Yeah. So I did read that, that he was very, very fond of his mother. Oh, absolutely. And so how did the nickname Hap come into play? Does that have something well, to do with his mother? Well, it's it's involved with that. The family's big on nicknames. Um, and, and in fact... Uh, uh, my grandfather, we now refer to as Hap, just to make it easy, uh, had at least three or four of these names. And Hap, Hap or Happy was one of them, but it wasn't the, the major name that anyone called him. You can find some letters sometimes, which I have, of other people who refer to him that way early, but, but it's very slight. His mother referred to him as Sonny. And in all the letters uh, where he's written his mother, and I have a lot of them, it's always signed, you're a sonny. And that continues on. And then she dies quite suddenly. And then the family never uses that name for him again. It's just too loaded. So he adopts Hap, which had been Hap or Happy, which had been kind of a secondary, uh, lightly used name. So he uses that one after that point. But there's an actual cutoff you can see. And one of the historians who wrote a rather nice book about him, uh, Dr. Dick Daso wrote a nice biography, actually did that work of laying out the timeline and the letters and the whole thing to make that case. And no one had ever noticed that before. The name Hap, what was his personality like? Was he a happy guy? Well, he had this, he had this kind of perpetual smile on his face that he, that he used. And it was very uh, considered to be very attractive. And in pictures, it sure looks that way. And that was just kind of like uh, this disposition that looked that way. Uh, that was the thing that he actually affected as an effective way of dealing with people most of his life. He certainly was a, f- a fellow who liked humor. He liked jokes. He told a lot of them. He pulled practical jokes on people and had all of that sort of thing. On the other hand, I, I'm reliably informed by people who got on the wrong side of him that while he was smiling at you, he's also stripping the skin right off your back about why you messed up. So, yeah, so, so, yeah, I, 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 I'm told the eyes were, were blue would get very icy while there was a smile going on, and then you were just in for it. In fact, Jimmy Doolittle one time told me the one thing that he always remembered about Hap Arnold, which he had he had known the two of them and known each other forever. Um, is that he said he was a man you did not want to disappoint. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And I think that covers a lot of a lot of real estate. And the two of them are very close. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to hear about really what their personalities were like. So let's let's go back now to you said he, originally he, he wanted to go into the cavalry um, right. and he ended up in the infantry and now he's entering this new realm of adventure, which is this uh, dangerous, very risky. Extremely dangerous, yeah. <laughs> aviation branch of uh, the service. So t- tell us about that. How, how does he get into that? Okay, well, so after his pal at the, at the Signal, Signal Court uh, signs him up as the original two and original contract, he and Tommy Milling are sent to uh, Dayton, Ohio, the Wrights have established a flying school that's now in the center of what is Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And you can go there. It's a national park site. You can visit this. And it has a, uh, the Wrights had been there. That's where the Wrights had perfected flying. Uh, this is where they really nailed it. Uh, and it took a couple of years to get the design going. It's a whole interesting story that the plane that they flew at Kitty Hawk that day would have flown nowhere else. And it had to do with the air density and the temperature and the wind and the whole thing. And it took them a while to figure out how to make an actual practical airplane that would fly under most conditions. That's what they do at that place. So uh, by this time, the Wrights have a couple of little hangers up. And that's where they would do all of their flying school and testing. It's a place called Huffman Prairie. And I do encourage anybody who's interested in flying to go there because you can stand there. It's pretty quiet. And and I've done this. And you, you can almost hear them 
starting up that engine and you can see where they flew in circles for hours oh, right man. there. It's, it's, yeah. it's amazing. Robert, yeah. I just want to interject real quickly here. I have been there. Uh-huh. Uh, my son-in-law was stationed at Wright Patterson. He was in, in the air force and we stood in that field and, you know, everybody else, the rest of the family, yeah, this is interesting, but oh, can we go now? And I just stood there. And yeah. like you said, I just was imagining yeah. hearing it, and seeing it going on. Yeah, you are you are standing in the place where the only successful flying in the entire world is taking place. You know, it is nowhere else. There isn't like 20 of these other guys somewhere else doing this. It's right there. And then and, and then the other thing that's kind of interesting for me is that so Hap goes there and he and Tommy go through the school and learn, you know, I think they flew 20 hours solo and were declared pilots. I mean, this is an amazing thing, right? <laughs> you're in. <laughs> yeah, you're in. You go, relax, let her go, Val. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. And the other thing that's kind of fun is years later, Hap and, and the family are back at what is now Wright Patterson. He's the commander at uh, what they used to call Fairfield Depot. Um, and he takes uh, my dad out to see the old flying field, which is there. And there was no, of course, no park or anything there. It's just a rundown hangar there. And so he goes and tells him out, tells dad and his brother, Hank, you know, about learning to fly. And they kick open the door of this place. And, and pop says there was a stick there with a, a sort of a gnarled red flag hanging on the end of it with holes in it. And Hap picks it up and says, this is what Orville used to wave at us so we would come in and land really oh yeah you know and you know you sit there and when i when i'm there i'm thinking they're all there my dad's there half's there the rights are there all in that one place you know and I, i'm just it just really gets me I'm, I'm it's like history moves through you standing there and the sad part is that that happened and then they put the flag in the pole back in this little rundown shack because it's like it's a sacred object and they should leave it there. And of course, it all disappears. It's all gone. You know, it just all was gotten rid of at some point. And uh, the original and the World War Two comes along and half is actually finally the chief and he can do stuff. Right. So the first one, of the first thing he says, OK, I want you to go out to uh, Huffman Prairie and get the damn hangar and I want you to preserve it. And. <laughs> This time it's gone, and they lie to him. Oh. They tell him they did <laughs> oh, no. because nobody wants to call back and say, "General, it was too late." <laughs> because he would be disappointed in Very that. Very disappointed. Oh, we took care of it. No problem, sir. Got it stored away for you. And that it, is yeah. something else. But just picturing all that happening right there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, what about the First World War? What involvement did Hap have with the First World War? Well, that, that whole part, which a lot of historians miss, and it's really important in the story. Um, before the U.S. involvement in the war, which starts in 1917, he has been out on the West Coast uh, at what it was called Rockwell Field, now called North Island Naval Air Station. But at that time, it was a very important Army uh, flying installation. Lots of history took place there. But they send Hap down to, to Panama, to see if he can solve a problem because the Navy and the Army are arguing over the, where they're going to be allowed to have airstrips. And the Navy doesn't want Army airstrips on its turf and the regular Army doesn't want these idiots with these airplanes on their turf. And they think maybe Hap can fix this. Nobody can fix this, by the way. So he sent him down there. So he's down there learning all about <laughs> these kind of issues and discovering Panama and all kinds of other stuff. So he finally gets fed up with this. So he's going to go up to Washington and, and talk to the boss, you know, with that points the signal corps. And what are we going to do here? And he's actually on his way up there when the U.S. declares war against Germany. Uh, and the signal corps is looking at the most experienced pilot that they've got. And they say, well, actually, you're going to stay right here. And they make him... Well, his title isn't that, and they make him the youngest colonel in the United States Army since the Civil War. How old was he? Do, gosh, I don't know. See, it was 1918, so 18 plus, so like 28, 29 years old. And he, at that point, he's like a, a, ma a major, okay? So they just jump him, 
uh, a temporary rank, by the way, which come, <laughs> they take back there, but it becomes that. And, and he ends up being the de facto head of the air service because all of the general officers in the signal corps don't fly. Yep. So he ends up doing all this. Well, the important part of it is he ends up setting up training schools. He ends up dealing with that. He ends up dealing with manufacturers and those problems and R&D uh, and uh, in the sense of uh, getting the with the Liberty Engine project going with Packard uh, parallels, dealing with that, dealing with the Merlin engine in World War II. All the problems of trying to get automobile manufacturers to make airplanes, all this other stuff, all of the production problems and all of these things and dealing with bond drives and dealing with the press and dealing with government. And as the war continues for the United States and all the money shows up, it attracts all the political flies. It always does. Yes. All these second raters who want a piece of the action show up. So then he has to deal with them and they're all connected somehow. And they all want, you know, a million dollars out of the pot for whatever they're doing. So he deals with all of this stuff. Meanwhile, he's a professional soldier. And what he wants to do is he wants to go to France and he wants to go to war. That's what he's supposed to do. Oh, yeah. So so he spends in the middle of all this trying to get himself over there, because as a professional soldier, he knows if he does not participate in the war and somehow it's not going to be a good thing for him going forward, because that's what he's supposed to do. But they look at him. We're not going anywhere, pal. <laughs> we, we can't make you go. But what he learns in this whole thing is that it's very easy to ramp up the training part of the deal. It's very hard to get American industry to start making a lot of airplanes. The conversion of automobile plants to making airplanes is wildly unsuccessful, wildly unsuccessful. So this begins a, a, an educational moment for him about how do you mobilize for war? How do you create this? For war and that pays off for world war ii this is why it's very important for him to have this experience but an interesting thing that also happens is the first bit of high tech comes in so the uh, the army comes up with the idea of a standoff weapon it's really interesting and the project they come up with is called the kettering bug and it is what we call the world's first cruise missile and it's all being designed by this group of people who happened to be in Dayton, Ohio, and happened to be people he had dealt with. <laughs> Here we are in Dayton been, again, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and he had been back there so many times for the Army dealing with the rights over time and had met all these other characters. As uh, most people don't know is that Dayton, Ohio, at one point, had more patents per capita than any other place in the United States. There are all these little tinkerers and adventurers of you know, the turn of the century into mid-century America there. And one of the key ones is Charles Kettering, who is another character he gets to know pretty well. Uh, Kettering invents the electric starter for automobiles and also air conditioning compressors, okay? Oh, thank you, thank you. Exactly. <laughs> and, and he has this little company called the Dayton Electric Company, which we now know as Delco, <laughs> okay, which eventually becomes part of uh, uh, General Motors. But there's that, and other characters pop up. Elmer Sperry pops up as part of this little consortium. Uh, Robert Milliken, who uh, ends up being the head of Caltech and a Nobel Prize winner and a key player later in Hap's life. He's also part of this project. So they're all, and so he's working with these people who are developing in a 1918 cruise missile. Okay, well, you know what it's going to look like. It's going to be a tiny little airplane, right? And so they come up with this thing and it, it has a guidance system and all this. And the idea was to make a whole bunch of these things and launch them across those front lines of World War I, which, are, which were not moving the whole trench war thing and just uh, uh, you know, blow the heck out of the Germans on the other side. And so he's involved in that project. Aha, uh -huh. okay, so now he's dealing with multiple scientists, engineering problem, future technology. So, and, and after many adventures, it kind of sort of works. And <laughs> although they almost blow up the intelligentsia when the when the missile goes in the wrong direction, almost oh. blows up the brow. Oh yeah, yeah. There's all. <laughs> yeah. You know, that sounds like it sounds like an episode of Hogan's Heroes. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. No, it, it, the thing would ever uh, lose its way and go nuts and circle the field and start diving at people. It apparently, it was a hell of a scene. So <laughs> anyway, so Hap has the idea. Aha. Uh -huh. 
I need to go over to Europe and brief General Pershing on the missile project. And only I can do this. And his plan is, is once he gets over there, his buddies who are running his squadrons of airplanes are going to give him one and he's going to go shoot the Red Baron. I mean, that's what he's up to, right? So, so he and a couple of his guys, and one of which uh, a couple of these people end up being kind of big in the uh, aircraft manufacturing business later, but they're all young officers at that point. They all um, go over on a, a troop ship over to Europe from New York. And this is 1918. The other thing going on in 1918, along with the war, is, of course, the, uh, the famous flu, so, uh, which kills millions and millions of people worldwide, and we talk about it today. He catches the flu on the ship on the way to Europe, almost dies, and then has a long recovery in Britain in a hospital there. But by the time he's feeling better, but they won't check him out, he's watching the clock running down on the war because he knows what's happening. They're going to end this thing. It's going to happen fast. And he's got to be part of this. He can't be sitting in a hospital in England with the flu when the war ends. So he actually checks himself out of the hospital by forging a signature on the papers gets himself on a ship over to France, gets himself up to the front, finds somebody he knows, and he says, get me an airplane. They, they put him in a fighter plane, and he takes off, and it's the morning of November 11th, 1918. Uh, the <laughs> so he actually, he actually flies for about an hour and a half before the armistice is over. So that was his entire work. work he experience. got it, though. He did it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's an absolute true story. You know, he was going to be not only determined he was going to fly something. So it doesn't quite call flying combat, but at least he got in an airplane over there. So he spends some time over in France and uh, connects more solidly with Billy Mitchell, who he got to know prior to uh, this particular point. And Mitchell and he form a, a more solid relationship at that point. Uh, personal relationship. So that's a good thing. And he gets to know Pershing as well. Now that's a good, that's a good way for me to segue back to your grandfather's family. So sure. your grandfather marries your grandmother and they have mm -hmm. how many children? Uh, let's see. So, so uh, happen B have the three brothers. They have my uh, aunt Lois and an additional son who dies as a two-year-old infant, which is another family tragedy. Yeah, I know that must have been hugely impactful. But I also know that your father's name was actually William. Was he named after Billy Mitchell? Yeah, yeah. That's the yeah, the whole the whole generation of kids in the, uh, who were air service uh, air service kids were all named Billy, and they were all named for Billy Mitchell. In fact, the the funny story is is that half is that. Um, Fort Riley, Kansas, after the Mitchell Court Martial, that's where he sent. And there's a bunch of a bunch of kids there, and uh, they were all named Billy. And so at, at dinner time, some mother would stick her head out the lit door of these quarters. Of course, they're on top of each other, and they would yell, Billy, Billy. And, and so there were so many of them that they actually all the mothers got together and and they had a meeting and they cut cards as to what the kids would be called. So whether it was going to be Will, Willie, William, Bill, Billy, you know, what it was going to, you know, what you're going to be called. And as Pop put it, uh, Granny didn't do well that day. So he became Bruce, which was his middle name. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's so, a story, isn't it? Yeah. So he was before that, he was known as Billy Bruce. Uh, and then after that, he was known as Bruce. Uh, when Hap writes his uh, series of um, uh, young boys books, the series is called Billy Bruce Stories, and that's the name of the character in the book, and that's named after my father. I did hear that your grandfather wrote kids' books. Yeah, he, he wrote a series of the Bill Bruce series, which are all about uh, his character, Billy Bruce, joining the Army Air Service and, and going through time being in it. Uh, and they're all based, uh, well, there's the drama he's added, but all the stories in it are based on people he knew and flying things that he was aware of, starting with the Wright brothers' involvement with the Army, all the way up through um, uh, the period when they're at uh, the Presidio uh, between the wars. So all the stories, so there's this whole series of them, uh, and they were very successful uh, and would have probably gone on, I think, how many did he write 
six of them, I think. He they probably would have gone on indefinitely, but he asked for more money from the publisher. They were paying him 200 bucks a book <laughs> and he wanted three. Does this sound like a familiar story today with rights and everything else? Yes. So that was the end of the series. So uh -huh. and now, where was he when he wrote those books? Oh, he was at Fort Riley, Kansas. And uh, he was, this is after the Billy Mitchell court martial. Uh, and he has stepped on the toes and, and annoyed the president of the United States personally. So he is exiled. <laughs> he was on the enemy's list. As a, he was exiled to Fort Riley, Kansas, which was considered to be the worst posting for an aviation officer in the army that you could get. Uh, it turns out to have worked out pretty well for him there. But uh, so that's where they are. So he is there uh, in this place where they're still, you know, the horse will never die. They're doing huge, you know, cavalry uh, maneuvers and encampments and exercises. And he's got this little cadre of airplanes spotting people there. Uh, and trying to figure out what he's going to do with his life. And, and actually, he, he befriends them really well. He, he ingratiates himself to the, the cavalry people, and it's a good moment in his life. It allows him to uh, really digest the Mitchell affair and realize that if he's going to make changes, uh, which he believes in, this whole thing called air power, that he's going to have to not be Billy Mitchell, that he can't throw the brick through the window, that he's going to have to network, he's going to have to build alliances, and he's going to have to find another way. Yeah, I think I read that Billy Mitchell, it was really, he was, he was accused of being insubordinate, and I guess he was, he felt very strongly about air air power and mm -hmm. how the military sure. could use it, and that's, mm -hmm. he just upset a lot of people, I guess. Well, yeah, when, when you when you call another service, you know, murdering your own people and stuff like that in public, you know, things, things, yeah, it doesn't go real well. Yeah, Mitch, Mitchell was uh, obviously a visionary, a romantic figure, but I think what we would call a outcome results oriented guy was probably not the strong point. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he had alienated almost everybody you can find. In fact, it still comes up today. Uh, anytime uh, another service is, uh, wants to stop the Air Force from doing something, they will say in meetings to the leadership, now we just don't need another Billy Mitchell moment here. They will say that even today. And I've heard this from some folks. Yeah. So your grandfather learned from Billy what not to do, but also he, he also admired Billy's heart, what was behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Billy Mitchell was his hero. There's no doubt about it. And the vision of the whole thing, absolutely there. But, but what he learned and what I think be sitting in Fort Riley, Kansas for a couple of years did for him uh, was to really take to heart what Mitchell had told him on the way out, which is don't be like me. You know, I have the, uh, the independent means to, to have another life here. Uh, don't be like me because Hap Arnold did not have money like that. Uh, to really take that into heart that, that you were going to have to do things. Many things happen at Fort Riley to support this, one of which he meets a lot of different people there who become important later. But the other thing is he joins the Masons. There was a time, particularly in the first half of the 20th century, where uh, being a Mason was uh, an entree into places wherever you went to. Uh, he becomes a Mason at Riley. And this allows him wherever he goes, he has an entree into the world of the people who own newspapers and businesses and bankers and doctors and lawyers that have an instant relationship when he shows up there and talks to these people. Uh, and then when he's on the road trying to spread this word about aviation and air power and, and army aviation in that case, he has that cachet. He has a really do it. And almost everybody he deals with in World War II is a Mason. I mean, you know, it's, it's FDR, it's Truman, it's, uh, it's Winston Churchill. I mean, it just keeps going. Uh, George Marshall, all of these people. So it, it creates a, uh, an instant level of relationship, which today would be very hard to understand. You know, it's something I don't think we quite could duplicate today, but it did. And that's one of the things that happens to him there. And this whole world of networking and doing, um, you know, education of people, whether it's writing books. He was writing articles under pseudonyms for popular magazines about flying and all kinds of stuff. The, I, I have to sell this. I have to create this whole um, uh, support in the public, uh, you know, for what we want to do. 
And I think that's where it really starts to come across. He's growing. He's leveraging, he lever leveraged really his uh, relationship with Billy Mitchell and that he learned from him. That's right. What yeah. to do and not to do, but also, you know, the becoming a Mason, he was leveraging that and he was learning how to affect change in what he wanted, but in a gentler way than Billy Mitchell. Yeah. He's got his eye on the prize and he's also realizing again, that running into the brick wall romantically is not going to get where he wants to go or to take things where he wants to go. And it begins to develop this idea about air power. And in his mind, it's the whole picture is it's not just a guy in an airplane with a scarf and the whole thing. It has to do with a research because he now knows those people and he's begun to know all those people as results of World War I. Uh, one of his lifelong friends is Donald Douglas, who becomes one of his not only close friends, but also a guide through that world and entree to other people who are engineers and builders. He begins to learn all of these things coming together, that air power starts with people designing, building, training, the weather guys, all of those things, the army part of it. That's the whole picture together. It's not just the bomb on the other end of the deal. And he talks about that his entire life is that it's the pyramid. And at the top of that is the guy in the cockpit that doesn't work unless everybody else from coast to coast is building this thing. Very different picture than the regular army and Navy is. It's just a very different, it's a different breed of cat. Uh, and it's, it's uh, sometimes hard for uh, writers and outsiders to understand how complex this whole thing is, you know, it's just some guy with a, with a pair of sunglasses and a plane. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. And this <laughs> is what he, he really understands. He understands two parts of it. One is it's the, you know, telling the, the romantic part of the story. This is part of the PR, but he also understands if you don't build the entire thing, that when the next war comes, they aren't going to, it's going to be like the last time, you know, they aren't going to have the things that they're going to need. Uh, in order to build it out. So this is what he's figured out. Now, just to pause for a second here, you mentioned your grandfather meeting a man named Douglas. Mm -hmm. Is that your other grandfather? Yeah, yeah. My my, my dad, Bruce Arnold, <laughs> married uh, Donald Douglas's only daughter, Barbara, in, uh, in 1944. Yeah. Those two families had been friends since 1917 and uh, close friends. Uh, and my dad met her when he was at West Point and she came and visited and uh, he danced with her at the, the big cotillion. In fact, she kept the dance card uh, her entire life and I have it. And it's got 20 names that you're supposed to write in there for each dance. And he wrote his name on every single line. Oh, that is great. <laughs> hey, that's another podcast for the future. That uh, There you go. Your other grandfather, man, that's incredible. So let's fast forward now to yeah. just before World War II breaks out when uh, Hitler invades Poland. Mm -hmm. Say it's about a little before that, 1938. Is that the year uh, that Hap becomes the chief of the Army yeah. Air Corps? Yeah, it's about then. What happens is that his friend, um, Tubby Westover, who was the chief, crashes and dies in Burbank. Um, and then Hap is the assistant chief at that point and moves into the slot. It's not easy because there's a lot of political opposition that again echoes of the uh, of the Mitchell moment. The regular army uh, general staff does not want some other Billy Mitchell showing up. And in a in a world we would understand today, they start a smear campaign in Washington to uh, influence our uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the president, into not appointing him. And this goes on for quite a while, making up stories. I mean, we talk we would talk about fake news today. They said while he was stationed in Hawaii, he was a drunk. He was never stationed in Hawaii. <laughs> he never <laughs> drank. But that didn't stop anybody. You know, that kind of, you know, right out of the headlines today. Same thing, right? And it, it only works out for him. He has created a whole network of, of friends and associates, well, key one being George Marshall, who, who wants him in this job. But the key one really turns out to be a combination of Franklin Roosevelt's son, Elliot, and Harry Hopkins. And it works kind of this way, is that prior to his uh, going back to Washington to become Westover's uh, assistant or vice chief, 
Hap is uh, commanding the March field uh, operation in Southern California, which at that time was a very major installation. It's still a major installation, but at that time a very major installation for Army aviation. And one thing he did while he was there is he connected himself with a lot of the Hollywood set that he had met earlier in World War I doing bond drives. And because he realized early on that if Hollywood figures showed up to stand next to airplanes, the, uh, the press would show up as well. So they would follow them. So he did a lot of things with them. And it became a place where people went. Amelia Earhart would drop in a lot. Uh, the scientists and engineers from this new aviation industry in Southern California would drive in, drop in a lot. Oh, he had people out there all the time. Gene Harlow would show up, all these other kind of characters. So it was known as a place that on the weekends that the Arnolds had a whole thing going on out there with kind of mini air shows and, you know, cocktails and tea and things like that. So it was a stop that a lot of people made. And so all of a sudden, one weekend out of nowhere, Elliot Roosevelt shows up. Well, he's the son of the president of the United States, but he just shows up. Now, in today's world, we would kind of recognize this, you know, the guy shows up entertaining me. We would kind of sort of see these things. But at that time, it was kind of unusual. So he pops up. And so uh, my grandmother, who was always incredibly gracious, very wise and very adroit, immediately charms him and moves him right into the whole circumstances, introducing everybody, making him the star of the show. Anyway, really, we call schmoozing him. <laughs> Ah, it works, yeah. right? She could, she could charm the hell out of anybody. But anyway, so, <laughs> so, so anyway, so they become very socially friendly. Okay, so Elliot goes back to Washington and, and, and remembering these good times and stuff. So Hap runs in, in he, and Elliot tells his father's associate, Harry Hopkins, who is really the key player in the, in the uh, Roosevelt White House and Roosevelt operation, uh, about this guy he's met in California, this guy named Hap Arnold, and gets things done, very smart, blah, 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 whatever, whatever you thought. So when things start to go wrong in this career move in 1938, Elliot goes to Harry Hopkins and says, listen, um, this is going sideways, and I think my father really wants this guy, should really want this guy. Hopkins goes in and tells uh, a skeptical Franklin Roosevelt, who doesn't want any scandals or anything, this is your guy, let's do it. And that's how it happens. It all happens because of these skills the family has made up over time of doing these kind of things. It's all personal. But he was he was the man for the hour. Oh, yeah. And, and, and this is what Hopkins, Hopkins, who does some background research, says, yeah, this is the guy we want. He is the guy. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's going he's gonna to fight for stuff, but he also understands how the game plays, and, you know, how the Washington game plays. You know, he's, he's not going to be that still the, in the Air Force at that time, or the Air Service, or Air Corps by that time. Um, there's still the, the bomb-throwing Mitchell crowd. They're still there, okay? The hardcore is still there. Uh, and they're just screaming and yelling about how we want to be independent now. We want to do this, we want to do that. And what they can't let that happen because it's going to just blow it all up at this point in the history of these things. So they, they don't want those people. So they need somebody who actually is going to fight for the air service, but it's not going to be those people. You know, it's going to be the combination. And here's this guy. And here's a guy also who knows everybody who makes anything to do with airplanes. He can pick up a phone and call somebody at an aircraft plant on the other side of the country and, and talk Turkey with them in a way that no one else can. I mean, he knows more about aircraft production than anybody else in the Army Air Forces, anybody. And, and they know he does. And so they can talk straight out and it's not BS. So that whole combination of things is what they see. And, and there you go. And he plays it very well. I mean, he, he gets it done. Uh, with very few um, uh, bumps along the way, one or two early on, but pretty much without any bumps along the way. Yeah, because right before the United States entered World War II with the bombing mm -hmm. of Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. our Air Force was sort of woefully behind many other nations, right? Oh, it's pathetic. I mean, I, I forget what the number is, but I think it's like 100 first-line aircraft, uh, you know, and like uh, 20,000 20, total uh uh, officers and men. I mean, I mean, that's about it. Um, it's like the 20th largest air force in the entire world or something like that. I mean, it's really sad. They have got bits and pieces of it. I mean, they've made 
They have built uh, planes that will become important, but they either have none of them or one or two. I mean, I think the total number of B-17s is like 30 or 40. It's a very small number. Um, there are prototypes flying, but they're not building a lot of them. They don't have all these fields of training facilities, all this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, it's just really kind of pathetic. And that's that's the challenge. The bits and pieces are there, but but uh, for the most part, but there's challenges are there too. Yes. And we were, of course, we were up against two formidable air forces in uh, you know, Japan and Germany, the Luftwaffe. Oh, yeah. Highly skilled, highly trained. Uh, they had manufactured a lot of planes. So we had to, we couldn't waste too much time getting up and running. So he, Hap had that huge challenge of, Oh, not only uh, the amount yeah. of stuff he had to do, but the time in which he had to do it, right? Yeah, yeah. So remember now that our adversaries had been in war for a while. Okay, so the the, uh, the Japanese had been at war with the Chinese for quite a while, right? So they'd actually been run at war. The uh, Germans had the whole thing going with in Spain. So they had were building equipment, testing equipment. Their people were flying missions down there and operations in Spain for some years. So they had experience. Uh, the United States, of course, is being very sleepy and isolated from any of these kind of things. Uh, the uh, what was it? The description I read was that the United States Army was kind of like having a border constabulary force that were chasing outlaws in the far west. I mean, it was pretty much like that. I mean, they had the, all these little bits and pieces and one or two guys, you know, you know, Patton with two tanks kind of thing, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's kind of like so. Yeah. So, so time is of the essence. The Air Force describes uh, half as a man in a hurry, uh, and that's and that's what he is. He knows he's in a hurry. He's got to do all the stuff at speed, and this is where he runs into initially problem with the Roosevelt administration, because uh, Roosevelt keeps saying, "Okay, we're just going to give all of these planes to uh, France and Britain because they're fighting this war that we're not." And, and he keeps saying, you can't do that. <laughs> I actually need <laughs> to, to build up our own forces uh, and gets in a, a whole fight with the State Department over this, who, as far as they're concerned, you know, just, well, we just give all this stuff to everybody and that's what we're going to do. And I don't want to give the stuff to them. Uh, ends up, that was the only near career ending thing that happens at the beginning of the war because he and the State Department get in a total cat fight. Uh, and Roosevelt gets annoyed by the whole thing. Uh, that blows over. Again, Harry Popkins plays a major role in this. But that's what's going on. Again, these kind of things run in circles. And you, you can almost, um, under, the, under the water, hear this today going on, uh, you know, with the, the Ukrainian versus U.S. needs and some of these kind of stuff. This is not a new story. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. So as the war progresses, mm -hmm. what the... Army Air Forces are doing is uh, strategically bombing, disabling the enemy's war machine, really taking them out. So Hap's Air Forces were disabling the enemy. They were such an effective force, but when they started, they didn't have much at all. And then no, no. it became, we did, did we actually become the largest air force uh, in the world by the end of the war? Yeah, in fact, the, the numbers even today are staggering. It's the world's most powerful air force and the, and the largest that the world will ever see. It'll never happen again. So the numbers he ends up with by 1945 is that any particular time, they're operating 75,000 airplanes, okay? I don't know what the Air Force has today, but it's less than four or 5,000, okay? You understand that? Okay, so it's just enormous. He has over 2 million people under his command. I believe there are over 900 Air Force installations. He's operating on every continent except Antarctica. And this is from 1939 to 1945, six years flat. It's, it's, it's an astonishing achievement that required huge amounts of drive and a lot of great people that he, had, you know, that he assembled. <clears throat> but it's just an astonishing achievement. You couldn't do this today. There is no way that the United States can duplicate that today in size of uh, production and time. It's just not going to happen. You know, you just can't build stuff like that because we had that total, um, you know, mobilization going on at that time. And you had, a, you had a number of companies making airplanes who could expand operations where in today's world, the amount of tech companies is, you know, really small. I mean, it's like, you know, basically, you know, Boeing. I mean, that's pretty much it. And there's Northrop and Lockheed. 
But even they, uh, you know, at that time, there had been you know, four or five times that many different manufacturers out there each making something. And then he could expand, you know, have them expand, which is what happens. These plants go rolling out across America. All these people get trained for it. I mean, we know about Rosie the Riveters and all this other stuff like that. But it's this huge mobilization. Um, you know, I, I used to joke that in any small town in America, there was probably a machine shop over there making something, you know, that, that went into a bomber somewhere, you know, it's down the street from the pop shop and there's some guy down there making, making parts and nobody even knows about it anymore. <laughs> but it was, it was like that. That vaulted us out of the Great Depression too, didn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. And of course, it was a basically, uh, you know, a manufacturing thing. And so, of course, the one thing Americans knew how to do in the 1940s was to make stuff. And so, you know, machine things and all that kind of stuff. And so that was there. So really, we could go on and on about World War II and uh, sure. your grandfather's contribution there, but because uh, it's so significant. And so what I understand during World War II, it goes from the Army Air Corps to the Army <coughs> air forces so it becomes more autonomous the air branch of the military becomes more autonomous right. and your grandfather gets doesn't he end up being promoted to at this point general of the army yeah what works this way is that they enter the war as the old army air corps very rapidly it's transformed into what they call the army air forces while it's still part of the United States Army, and he wants it that way because it's now not the time to split everything up and, and have to do things. But because of his relationship with George Marshall, who is the chief of staff of the Army and his nominal boss and his very old friend and a very close relationship, he is allowed to have as, uh, near autonomy in everything he does, pretty much solid autonomy. The two of them were close. They trusted each other. Uh, they talked it out privately, uh, made these things happen. And, and so he was able to operate that way through the entire war. Although they did still attach the army, so he didn't have to create, you know, judge advocate generals. He didn't have to create all of this army infrastructure that had nothing to do with his direct operations. So they were able to continue that. So he didn't have to create a whole nother, you know, set of, set of things you want to do. So that allows that to happen. It is called the Army Air Forces because they had all these numbered air forces, which they still do, but that's why they call it the Army Air Forces. Now, what happens is, is that he's rapidly promoted to four-star general, which at that time was the highest rank in the business. Mm. But what happens is for the first time in our history, uh, the United States military is working jointly on a very close basis with uh, with a foreign government, which in this case is, is Great Britain. Right. So very tight with them, what they call the Combined Chiefs of Staff. Now, the British have a, another rank called Field Marshal and Fleet Admiral, okay? And so technically, that's a higher rank than the four-star rank that we have. Now, frankly, General Marshall and half Arnold could care blinking less because they're carrying the big stick anyway, because we have all the toys, right? And we understand that. However, the United States Navy, who is always rank conscious, now, yesterday, and forever rank conscious, did not like going to meetings with the, uh, the British Admiralty and being outranked by these people. So they insisted that a special rank be created for the, uh, the leadership so that they would be on an equal footing with the British. So... <laughs> So, so the president of the United States, being a Navy person, says, sure, we'll just go ahead and create that. So they create, uh, you know, a fleet admiral for, for the Navy, and that becomes, you know, uh, you know Admiral King and, and uh, later, of course, Nimitz uh, as well. So the idea was the, the general marshal says, I will not be called field marshal marshal. <laughs> that doesn't roll off the tongue too well. <laughs> Not going to happen. So they create this very uh, odd sounding thing called General of the Army, okay, which writers inevitably to save space, you know, contract down to Army General. So you get these idiot things where they say that, you know, uh, Hap Arnold's the first Army General in the Air Force or something like that. It just make any sense, right? Okay. <laughs> so, but anyway, so that's where the title comes from. So, and the whole thing was the idea was that they would be meeting with on an equal footing with the uh, British general staff. Okay. 
So this is why this is never going to happen again. Every time we have a successful war, which the last one would have been the Gulf War one, they've got General Schwarzkopf is going to be uh, promoted to five star general. It wasn't because you won. It was, <laughs> it was because you had to deal with these people and you were commanding millions of people. <laughs> and we're never going to have an opportunity in, in, a, in our lifetime and hopefully never to have a war where that would be required. So, uh, so that's why they did that. So at a point where they created all this, uh, uh, Hap is dealing with, uh, with the, uh, the air marshals over in, in Britain. Uh, Dudley Pound comes to mind and a couple of other ones uh, over there too, uh, is that uh, they have to create that rank. So they give him that rank. And then at the end of the war, when they create the, uh, the separate air force in 1947, Truman says, yeah, we'll make you part of this new one too. Uh, you know, that's what they, they created that. So because technically a uh, uh, five star general never really retires. So technically he's sort of on sort of active duty for the rest of his life. So he got general of the army and yeah. general of the air force and in both that's right. five stars. Yeah. So so the joke in the family is, is the only 10 star general in the history of the United States. He got 10. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not true. I mean, but it's, it's fun. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and the only guy that outranks him, well, actually, there are two. Uh, uh, on a slow day in the 1970s, Congress promoted George Washington to six star rank. <laughs> Nothing else to do. And, <laughs> and, and the other one, of course, was that at the end of World War I, they promoted uh, Pershing to the one off title of General of the Armies, which was a one time title because he had commanded the biggest army that they had ever seen, you know, at that time, you know, for World War One. So that's why it's general of the army. So it's hard to deal with, but that's what it is. So that's the story. Amazing. So so your grandfather got to see the United States Air Force become a separate branch. And uh and that was shortly before he died, because your grandfather died, I think in 1950. 1950, yeah. So so the Air Force became separate in 47. And, uh, and he actually got to wear a blue uniform. He had a blue uniform made for him. And then uh, he actually he sees a lot of things. I mean, it, it, the time compresses here. Uh, I've got a great photo of he and uh, Chuck Yeager right after the supersonic flight. Uh, Orville Wright is still around at that moment. He's just, he dies shortly thereafter. I mean, this whole if you look at the sweep of this whole thing in these lifetimes, uh, what happens from A to B is quite extreme. And we're already talking missiles and all that other stuff. And and he's already thinking, but he's writing about where we're going. He's already talking about, you know, uh, electron, what do you call it, electronic, you know, aircraft and missiles. He's talking about, you know, mechanical machines that think and all. He's, he's writing about all of this stuff at the end of his life uh, about where he sees the future going. Uh, a man who definitely uh, had no limits to his imagination. And this is a man who was born about, if I did the math right, about 12 years after the Civil War ended. Correct. And as my father used to talk about when my father was a kid, they would go to the uh, to the Fourth of July parade and they would have Civil War veterans go marching by. You know, the, the compression of time is really quite interesting in that, you know, it went from that whole sweep. I mean, uh, the first refrigerator that my my dad ever saw was so they all had ice boxes and ice men deliver was at Billy Mitchell's house in Virginia. Okay, so this is in the 20s. Okay, so they went out to Billy Mitchell's house and Mitchell's had money. So they had one of these newfangled refrigerators and they all went to the kitchen and stared at it and it had made ice cubes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, they went like, it was like, you know, like, you know, you, I don't know what it would be today, you know, going out looking at something weird, you know, Maserati outside. <laughs> but anyway, but, and, and, and all like that. And, and Pop was, so, Pop's a kid was so intrigued with it that after the adults go into the other room to, to have whatever libations they're going to have, is that Pop goes and takes all the, the ice cubes out of the refrigerator and goes out front and they set up a lemonade type stand selling ice cubes to the neighborhood kids. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and they get spotted and his father comes out and is absolutely just torqued and my like, god you stole this guy's ice cubes <laughs> and but fortunately billy mitchell thought it was funnier than hell so it all, it all went over the top <laughs> but that's but that but that was the first one they had ever seen 
I mean, and that's in his lifetime. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, and that from there, B-29s, atomic bombs, missiles, satellites, Space um, programs. radar. I mean, just keep going. I mean, all that stuff, you know, it's quite yeah. amazing. I'm thinking about the space program, actually, because I'm thinking because of what happened in World War II, Mm -hmm. brought us way closer to the space program than we, you know, it well, probably wouldn't happen for decades. Well, I've, in fact, the, the interesting crisscross here is that a major figure in the U.S. missile program is Bernard Schriever, known to all as Benny Schriever, who has uh, passed away now. He was a four-star general, but he was the uh, creator of the whole ballistic missile project for the United States. Benny Schriever was an Air Corps lieutenant uh, stationed at March Field. He was married in my grandparents' quarters there and goes off, has a successful war as a fighter pilot. But he was always interested in the science and technology thing. And as he wrote uh, later years, he said, and Half Arnold personally has sent him on a mission to deal with this whole missile thing. You know, so he saw the future, said, this is what you should do. You know, this is the, and there we go. And this is a guy who creates from scratch but we now know the Atlas, the Minuteman program, all those other kinds of things. This is an old Hap Arnold guy. <laughs> so, so not only was there a, there were a lot of stuff was invented yeah. and came into being during that yeah. period of late 30s through the yeah. mid 40s, but also the precursors and the ideas and the thoughts. Oh, yeah. Early technology for, you know, even bigger and better advances were coming into play. Well, the thing he had always seen is that, uh, as he always said, that what he had learned from the Wright brothers was that nothing was impossible, that you couldn't just say that can't be done. Well, I don't know about that. Let's see what happens, that there was no limit to where technology could take you. So therefore, if you can imagine it, it could happen. It may not happen today, but it could happen. So so why not? So if you can imagine uh, you know, he wrote about earth circling satellites. He wrote about this, all these kinds of things is that why not? You know, yeah. I've seen pieces of it. I've seen the, what the Germans did when he goes over to France in 1944 to visit Normandy after the invasion. Uh, he is actually staying in a, in a country house outside of London when he comes back from visiting the beaches and seeing what's going on and talking to his guys. The first V1 buzz bombs arrive. And one uh, lands about two miles from where he's staying and explodes. So they go over and look at the, uh, the you know, the crater where the, where the pieces are. Uh, interesting enough, the V1 buzz bomb is a German version of the Kettering bug that they had built in 1918. It used exactly the same uh, guidance system. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you know exactly what it was. So he writes about it in a letter with my, to my grandmother about visiting this this crater and include include some pieces of the debris which I still have. Anyway, so this whole thing and there it is, you know, you know, you saw one happen. There it was. Heard the thing down there. The engine knew exactly what it was. Bam, there it goes. Uh, and these were exactly. And he himself had seriously considered making versions of that to shoot at the Germans in 1941, 1941-42, instead of doing the entire bomber fleet, but felt they couldn't take the technical risk. So he had thought of that. And that way history could have gone a different way, right? <laughs> Definitely. You know, I almost think about if your grandfather lived today um, with what, well, what's available, but would there have been the need, uh, would it have been in the right circumstances? Would there have been a Billy Mitchell for him? Would there have been a George Marshall for him? Yeah, yeah. as far as leadership goes, yeah. And putting somebody in the same place today, that's a good question. Uh, the character of these uh, these enterprises, these organizations and the people in them is very different now. He would have been very happy with the level of smart, the education that these folks have, the, uh, the technological tools that they have. He would have been very happy with all that. And the fact that right down to the guy you know, at the lowest level job in the Air Force is pretty damn smart by his standards. I mean, they're very highly educated. He would have been very happy with that. He would have been very unhappy with the speed of change. Yeah. That it takes 20 years to bring out a new airplane and they fly them for 50 years. He would have been very unhappy with that. He yeah. would have been happy that they were well built, but he would not be happy about the, the state of change. And I think also that he would have been unhappy that the, the contemporary Air Force doesn't spend enough time 
explaining itself and its mission to the American people. They really don't. Uh, I've had this conversation over my lifetime with a number of these contemporary folks who are, oh, it's very smart guys and, and women and, and, you know, and very bright and, and focused and all those sort of things. But they don't understand what he saw, which is that if you don't have the American people supporting what you do, it doesn't go very far. I don't think they quite understand that. They think they do, but they really don't because things would not turn out the way they do sometimes. And as far as supporting programs or, or, or change, if they had that kind of support, that he understood. And I don't think, I think that's what I see is missing today. He would be very disappointed in that. And he would give them a hard time about it. He would tell them exactly what about it. Oh, he <laughs> would. I can tell that. You can tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. This has been so enjoyable, Robert, because you're giving us a, a little peek at the, the personality, the practical joke side, the... Uh, yeah, we didn't even get into all of the, all the crazy ga gags he, pl he played on people and all kinds of stuff. This is a guy with a very, very rich and broad story to tell that would go on for a very long time. But I'm, I'm glad we had an opportunity to talk about some of it. Yeah. And before we close, though, a couple of things. I like to do this often when I interview grandchildren of famous mm -hmm. people. I mm -hmm. don't like to, to forget about, you've mentioned about your dad a few times, but I don't like to Forget about the person in between. And mm -hmm. uh, just, a, just a little more information on your dad. Your dad was, was also a military man, correct? Correct. Yeah, yeah. He, he like his two brothers, also went to West Point. Um, he was uh, definitely a, a, career, a career soldier, and he made the matriculation over to the Air Force after 1947. They, at that point, they were trying to fill that out, so they were trying to actively get people to move from the regular Army into this new service and his father wanted him to do that um, you think? yeah yeah my father did not have the uh, vision to be a pilot and he wore glasses like i do did not have the the vision to meet the standard and as far as he was concerned if you weren't a pilot in this air force you weren't going to have a great career so i'm not going to go do that i'm not going to do that so he's having this argument and his father says you know i want you to i, I don't want to do that so, so he's my father's summoned to the retirement ranch, which is located in Northern California, um, to come up there, and we're going to talk about this. So he is summoned at this point. Pop is down at Point Magoo on the coast uh, in the early Army missile business. So he goes up there, and it's it's all alone with his father in the old ranch house, and there's a bottle of bourbon on the table. And half Arnold says to him, "We're going to sit here and drink this bottle until you agree with me." <laughs> Great strategy, Pop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so it, it goes on for a long time. And then and then my father finally said, you know, okay, fine. It's that important to him. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. So he, can, he converts over to the Air Force, has a whole career in missiles and high tech, which worked out very well for him. But uh, so that's what he does that. So, so he was that, uh, he's that person. Yeah, he was a, he was a, uh, an interesting person. Uh, uh, career soldier, sense of humor, wouldn't quit. I can see uh, you've got some of that too, Robert. Oh yeah. Well, he was a great guy. I wish I had more of it. He was a great guy, uh, known throughout the entire service, uh, ends up uh, working uh, Congress for the Air Force a couple times in his career, makes huge friends from the whole generation of old timers. They're all gone now, of course, you know, uh, whether it was Barry Goldwater and a bunch of other folks. Um, they knew all those people on the Hill because he's a West Pointer. He cannot lie. He will not lie. He will never tell you anything that's not true. And he lived that way and uh, without being stiff about it. And they all knew that. So he was a trusted guy. <laughs> there were, and I had so many of them tell me that, that when, when, when your father would tell us something that the, uh, was going on in the Air Force one way or the other, we could actually believe it. We knew he would not tell us if it wasn't true. You can hang your hat on it, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So he would tell funny fibs and stuff. But if there was anything else like that, and, and, and he had to do something, he was almost like watching the, the fuses blow. You know, it was like, <laughs> they built that into him at West Point very well. <laughs> yeah. And he was a, a big storyteller. He, I mean, when I say big storyteller, he was very good at recounting stories, wasn't he? I, I'm, yeah. I'm lucky in my life is that my dad loved telling stories about his father and the growing up in the early flyers and, and the people he met. And he met a lot of these folks. 
and I met some too, but not, of course, not as many as he did because of a different time. I was very lucky he did that. And then he also wrote uh, a whole memoir about growing up in the family and all the places we went. So I've been very lucky to be able to have all that down. And I've been working slowly on it for a couple of years to make it in some kind of a, uh, an accessible uh, book for the general public. So I continue to work on that from time to time. But the uh, but they're all there, all these little places and, and, and a world that does not exist anymore. I mean, when we read the book, you're not only getting the saga uh, of, of Hap Arnold, but you're getting the world they move through, you know, whether it's all these old army posts, it's the change in times, it's, you know, the, the roads they drove in, the kind of cars, the, the life they had, the, you know, the, the 1918 flu, the, uh, there's all of this history of America that goes through in the background, which is really kind of fascinating to see part of and the changes one of them that dad talked about <clears throat> when they're at fort riley kansas which i mentioned before it's the home of the united states cavalry and there's the 1920s and there's still a significant horse cavalry going on and at that point one summer when they're there they're moving a whole cavalry division from up in the northern plains to riley they did these kind of things a lot and so half came home told my father one afternoon he says we have to go out and watch this. They're moving an entire cavalry division in here, all with horses and wagons. And we're all going to come through here and it's going to be hundreds and hundreds of people. He says, and you're never going to see this again. So we're going to go out and watch this. And here they come. And they, they, they had camped outside for two days, five miles away, got themselves all cleaned up and and everybody all polished and everything, and they all come riding in like a John Wayne movie, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, the camera. You know, hundreds, uh, yeah, hundreds of these people on horses and horses pulling wagons full of stuff and all this other stuff, you know, and they're making their big, you know, arrival of an entire, you know, mounted cavalry division on the move, right? If it had been like 1875. He saw that happen. Yeah. yeah. And, and his father said, you need to see this because you'll never see this again. So my father told that story it's in this book. You know, Robert, you've well, we've got a, a very, very famous family, a family that has contributed hugely to American history. But what's what's really great is we're called Your History, Your Story. We like to interview people who have really important stories to tell, interesting stories mm -hmm. to tell. You do it so well. And I, I know you're you heard a lot from your dad, but you've retained it. You've obviously done a lot of research and stuff yourself, a lot of reading. But it's such a pleasure to speak with you because you do bring history alive and you bring it from a national standpoint, from uh, you know, from maybe ten thousand feet. But you can you can zoom right into that uh, that den with the glass of bourbon and the conversation between your dad and grandfather. That is priceless. So thank you so much for being a guest on our show. Well, thank you. Enjoyed having the conversation and you made it very easy for me to recall and tell these stories. So thank you for doing all that. <laughs> and, and, and one last thing is, so I understand you are a winemaker. How long have you been a winemaker? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm semi-retired now. Uh, my family and I, my dad and I, my mom started a winery uh, back in about 1986. Happened to be my grandmother had bought property in Sonoma, California, up here in the California wine country at the end of World War II, although they were not in the wine business. In those days, that was not a, a thing people did pretty much. Uh, but uh, I ended up with a property in the early 1980s. Uh, and so uh, we decided to start this little wine project up. And I, after my folks passed away, I continued it on. And we, uh, we made wine, grew grapes and sold wine for, gosh, over 30 years. And I uh, had a lot of fun with it. Uh, retired out of that some years ago. And now these days I work for a a uh, little family winery over in Napa, and I do some special pouring things for them and having some fun. So uh, I, that's my retirement job. I get to pour wine and still be part of the business. But we had a lot of fun doing that. So I uh, made a lot of wine, won a, lo won a lot of gold medals, and made a lot of friends with it. So it was a good ride. Terrific. Well, thank you so yeah. much, Robert. And I hope we can stay in touch because I want to hear, I know you occasionally go around and talk about your grandfather. I want to mm -hmm. keep plugged into that and, uh, because you, you, again, I say you bring history to life and thank you again. Well, I enjoy, I enjoy bringing these stories out because uh, it's the only way people are ever going to know them and uh, I appreciate the opportunity and have to do anything with you anytime. All right. Thanks. And have a great day, Robert. Same to you, sir. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.
Thank you for joining us for this episode of Your History, Your Story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YHYS Podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.